Hi, everybody. How are you tonight? This is Molly's Salon, our weekly program each Thursday evening, where I interview innovative thinkers and creative firebrands. We're living through a critical time in American history, the COVID-19 pandemic and a vital social justice movement led by Black Lives Matter. And our guests are a variety of artists and leaders who are discussing new ideas, how they're coping with the coronavirus and making positive social change, as well as showing us glimmers of hope for the future. My guests this evening are Stephen Smith, Program Director of Columbia Pike Revitalization Organization, and Matt Connor, playwright, Ricardo Hernandez, theater designer, and Camilla Forbes, Artistic Director of the Apollo Theater. And first up are Stephen Smith and Matt Connor, and they are veteran Washington area musical theater artists. Matt is a composer, artist, and piano teacher and performer. Stephen is an actor, writer, director, teaching artist, and has been seen on stage many times at Signature Theater. You will recognize him. Together, they are a prolific writing team. I'm so sorry the dogs aren't here. Where did they go? We're here. Oh, oh, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad that they're here. Um, and uh, as a writing team, you guys did something really interesting. You, in 2019, you set a goal for writing a musical a year for five years. Will you talk about that and how you came to that decision? Well, you know, uh, Creative Cauldron had uh, wanted to do this bold new work project of five years. And it, I think initially the thought was to get five different writing teams. Um, as we talked about it, uh, me and Steven uh, kind of suggested that we would like to maybe take the challenge on ourselves. And so we did. Now, the, the great thing about me and Steven writing together is that we can't really get away from one another. So. <laughs> You have a lot of time to really delve into, you know, lots of conversations over dinner, lots of conversations, lots of movies together. We kind of, we kind of fill in a blank when we're, we're writing. So yeah, we did tackle five new musicals and have kind of worked on a new project since then. So yeah, we completed the cycle of five in 2019. Actually, we started it in 2014. Um, so yeah, that's done. Put that one to bed. <laughs> yeah, and the last one we just did on air, which is uh, based on the uh, radio, will you explain the radio station KDKA? The first radio station in America, KDKA in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, started as a broadcast out of um, Frank and Flora Conrad's unassuming garage in Pittsburgh. Um, and she was a suffragist and she wanted to announce the, the election results in 1920. On air because she had worked so hard, they just got the right to vote. And she said, well, we finally have the right to vote. I don't wanna wait till the paper to hear the results. So they broadcast those election results. And that was just turned into a radio play because Duquesne University was going to do it uh, last year. And so we did turn it into a radio play that was uh, listened to, gosh, what was it? Four or five different countries, almost half of America got to tune in and listen. So that was fun. You guys have a pretty remarkable range of work too. Why don't you talk about a couple of the other projects? You're you really have sometimes moved into things that are would be considered um, uh, thrillers or horror imagery. I mean, why don't you talk about that? Um, that's that's a lot of my influence on the the two of us. Um, the The Turn of the Screw and Monsters of the Villa Diodati were the first two shows both bearing on literary subject matter, of course, the Henry James novel, um, and then the, the monsters being the, about the famous summer that uh, Lord Byron and Percy Shelley, Mary Shelley, all summered together on Lake Geneva and came up with a writing challenge to create the world's best ghost story. And out of that, Frankenstein, of course, came about. And also Dr. John Polidori wrote The Vampire, which Bram Stoker, later rewrote as Dracula. Huh. So the two legendary kind of uh, icons of horror were born out of basically a bunch of people who were self-hating and saw the monsters in themselves and put that on paper. Uh, so that fascinated me, but we moved into 
Alzheimer's was the theme of the third show. Yeah, Flo Lacey, we worked with her at Signature Theater. She came to me and said, I want you to write a show about Alzheimer's. And it took many years, but we finally found the window into it and we turned it into its own show. The, the actress dealing with Alzheimer's was an actress sort of forgetting her lines and it was very theatrical. Um, I wanted to give the play the disease. Um, and handle the, the telling of the play as if the play couldn't remember what it was trying to say. Yeah, yeah. So it was, I don't know how she memorized it because it was fractured dialogue at times, but she, she liked it enough to come back and rejoin for the fourth show, which was Witch, which was uh, set at the Women's March. It was an eight cast all women play. Um, Kaleidoscope was also all women. We love writing for women. Yep. Kaleidoscope uh, was the Alzheimer's yeah, piece. Yeah, uh, and which is kind of contemporary music. Uh, it was a, really an outcry protest piece because I thought the election was gonna go a different way. So I wrote a piece about it. And now we're working with um, the Synetic Company on a piece uh, sort of exonerating the five women killed by Jack the Ripper. Talk about a little bit about Synetic because some of our audience may not be aware of the kind of physical work that they do. Yeah, I actually worked with Synetic uh, once uh, years ago when they were still back at the uh, on uh, at the Church Street Theater, and uh, they're very physical. It's almost like a, 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 I don't want to say a ballet troupe, but every other storytelling is told in a very cinematic, physical way. And they really changed my perspective when I worked with them in my own creation and storytelling. And um, so this experience with them won't really be a musical. It would definitely be a hybrid of what they do and what we can bring to their um, theater. So we're very excited. Aren't they trained from uh, Russia as well? Is it Georgian? Georgia. Georgia. Yeah. Georgia. So yeah. that's, that's their background. Yes. Because it's really uh, physical, intense work. Stanislavski. Uh, they'll, they'll, Stanislavski. I mean, they'll, they, they will take a, um, a piece of music where they will take a story and it'll be, it'll be a Shakespeare, but it will be wordless Shakespeare. It'll all be done in dance with music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're really, they're really dynamic. I think they're, they're unusual in this city for their work. Yeah, I wouldn't exactly say they're like a theatrical Cirque du Soleil, but if anyone's familiar with Cirque, they definitely are in that world. Mm -hmm. Only a bit darker. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, they're Russian. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're Russian. So um, we just have a few minutes left, but I would love to know what glimmers of hope you each see for the future. Huh. Um, Joe Biden, uh, <laughs> a better leadership from the top that will help us get through this crisis. Um, I think there's been a lot of progress with the Black Lives Matter movement and even addressing theater through that realm. And I think as we were saying earlier, there is no new normal. I mean, there's a new normal. There's not getting back to normal. We have to think forward always and think Okay, so that's not happening again. So what's the new world? And just move within that space. And what did, what did we learn? What did we learn? And I know you both are going to have a, a new talk show, which you've already started. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's at anchor.fm slash Connor and Smith show. We're interviewing anyone from Alicia Gamble was on last week, uh, Susan Derry, our dear friend and the muse of our five-year musical plan. Um, will be on this coming week. But we're not just doing theater, we're doing anything from our state senator to a former delegate to someone who's working for the Lincoln Project to a YouTube food uh, like, like a chef. So we're going all around trying to apply creative thought to politics, to cooking, to art just in general. We will eventually get to our friend who created the Klingon language. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, wonderful. Uh, great to see you both, and uh, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Take care. Bye, see Matt. Bye, Stephen. See you soon. Ricardo Hernandez has designed over 250 productions, including Broadway at most leading regional theaters and opera across the U.S. and internationally. 
He's been awarded numerous accolades, including the Obie Award for Sustained Excellence of Scenic Design, Princess Grace Statue Award, many others. Uh, he is the Assistant Professor of Theater Design at Yale School of Drama. He designed for Arena's production of Celia and Fidel, which was cut short last winter. And he's the designer of Tony Stone, which was also postponed from Arena's season because of the pandemic. So um, I feel like you're with us always, Ricardo, because we have two of your sets sitting at Arena Stage in view of the audience who might want to come into those ghostly rooms. Lord. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. it's so it's so great to see you. And um, I'd love to just talk just for a few minutes about uh, Celia and Fidel. Yeah. And um, and maybe we, what we can talk about is the visual expression of what you created in terms of being inside of Fidel's head and how you think about him and uh, how you think about him as uh, the kind of dictator that he became uh, and what references you see certainly to uh, the United States. Right. Um, thank you for having me, Molly. Um, Celia and Fidel, well, the most important thing to me about the play was, is um, how to create this slice of Havana, Cuba in this wonderful theater um, and let those words resonate to, to really hear the argument about the, the revolution. Um, when you and I talked uh, about the play, it, it seemed to me that we, we wanted to create something that portrayed in, in terms of the space, the mind of this uh, leader. Um, and we did a lot of research as you recall, and we found these amazing photographs of his office in Havana. And he was an avid reader. He loved reading. You know, one of his great friends was uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. You know, he was, uh, uh, Quite an amazing maverick that way when it when it came to to reading and knowledge. So we thought, well, what why don't we take that idea, looking at those photographs and making it theatrical? In other words, giving it a scale that would fit in the in the world of uh, the the arena stage space. Um, and what I loved about the space is, is, is that it's, a, it's this circular oval environment, which reminds me a little bit of the United Nations in a way. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the fact that it's all made out of wood, we thought, you know, well, let's create this bookshelf and make it this operatic, but also very real um, element with the books, his little statues of, of Karl Marx and Lenin and Bolivar and others. Um, but then the other thing that I found very intriguing is you, you kept talking about how, how do, we, do we invite the audience into the world of the Cuban revolution um, without doing you know, things that may be obvious. Um, and so I remember you and I walking down that hallway, you know, going around the curve uh -huh. Uh -huh. and basically creating an installation to not only Fidel, but, but also Celia. Um, and then entering into the space and you're sitting down in his office with him in a way. So that, that to me, that, that, that was, um, a very exciting, um, experience. And I had never, and you know, as you know, I was born in Cuba, but I had never done a, a play or an opera or anything like that, where Fidel is, was, a a, a character. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it was amazing to sit down in, 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 in rehearsals and hear the words, the arguments of this wonderful, beautiful play that uh, Eduardo wrote. Um, and yeah, that, that, would, that was to me the, 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 the most, um, the, the, the greatest challenge, um, creating a space and depicting his mind in that space. Now, what can I say about the Cuban Revolution and what I learned from it, 
you know, I, I was born there. I was, a, you could say I'm a product of the Cuban revolution. I was born in 1965. Uh, my mother was a communist from Argentina. And my father was Cuban and he did not like, uh, did not relate at all to communism. So in my home, we had that, 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 that struggle, that, that, that dialogue between, you know, this utopic dream, you know, this utopia that was mm -hmm. unfolding in, in Latin America and badly needed and badly needed. Um, so to hear so, 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 some, of the, so, some of the comments and thoughts that Celia has in the play mm -hmm. reminds me or reminded me of mm -hmm. the possibilities that, you know, mm -hmm. of that revolution. Mm -hmm that slowly but surely he turned into a, a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. So it's very conflicting even to this, to, this, to this day for me. I remember after the first preview, Eduardo and I went, went for drinks and that's all we talked about. Mm -hmm. Both Cuban exiles, you know, very different stories, but both kids when we, when, when we left the island. So, you know, I, I, it's, uh, it's something that it's in our blood. It's confusing at times, but I do think that, you know, in retrospect, there are things that the revolution did do that have been worthy of recognition. For example, education, healthcare, uh -huh. and many other things. The arts in Cuba are uh -huh. incredible. Uh -huh. um, so that, 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 that is where I feel, you know, it was wonderful to revisit that whole history in, in you know, inside of this space doing this play. Well, you did a beautiful job and it's still in the Kogod cradle nestled in the middle of that, of that uh, beautiful room, just waiting for actors to come back and inhabit it. But I think that there was uh, certainly something deep and profound about your background uh, that you brought to it. Because as soon as we started talking about it, you just took off. And um, I also love the fact that the bookcases, because there's magic realism in it, yes. that you lifted the bookcases. So in a set, they're enormous and yet they're floating. Right. And so we're always aware of um, this other reality within it. Right. So I'm, I'm curious about, it's a heck of a question, uh -oh. uh, but what's your philosophy around scenic design? How do you design? Uh -oh. Do you design through ideas? Do you design through your senses? Do you design through the text itself? Do you design through? We only have a few minutes, yeah. so I'm really putting you on the spot, but I'm curious about it. I'll say this, I am 56. I have, I've been very fortunate to be working you know, for a few years and I, I have changed. I, when I was younger, I, I wanted to encapsulate, to capture on a, a big idea that was the play. And as I've gotten older, and more mature, I, I gravitate to what's in the text. The text is what leads to find, it's, it's, it's almost like a topographic map. You have to dissect it. And from there you find the elemental or the essential that is the space. And the most important thing is you have to deal with the bodies in space and allow spaces to, to allow for the words of those plays or musicals or whatever the case may be to resonate. So I think the play is the thing, we serve it. It is, and give us one word about the uh, incredible musical that you're working on right now. Jagged Little Pill? Yeah. It, uh, it, it, it rocks the house. It's, and, and actually, no, truth be told, after post pandemic, it's a piece that ultimately deals with healing. Uh-huh. Great. And so we can't wait until it's either touring around the country or it's back on Broadway and uh, people need to go and see it and see uh, Ricardo's work. Great. It's beautiful to have you on. Wonderful to see you, Ricardo. Thank and you, uh, take care. Thank you.
Bye bye. Next, we have Camilla Forbes, and she's an esteemed award winning director and producer for theater and television. She's the executive producer at the world famous Apollo Theater in Harlem. And in her body of work, she's noticed for having a strong commitment to the development of creative work by, for, and about the hip hop generation. She's an alumni of Howard University. Arena Stage saw her work as a director with Blood Quilt in 2015. And this will be something she'll be surprised at as soon as she comes on and sees me. I remember many years ago in my first year at Arena Stage when you were in Charles Randolph Wright's production of Oak and Ivy ah! and you were a student at Howard University. That's right. That's right. That's that's how I got my equity card. <laughs> Charles always reminds me that. <laughs> he always reminds me. And, and it was um, God, what a what a great experience that was. It was a really great experience for me. It's a beautiful play about Paul Lawrence Dunbar oh, and his work. That's it was right. gorgeous. Yeah. It was, it was gorgeous. so and yeah, it was an honor to work on that and with the brilliant artists that were all a part of that project. And it's funny but running into those folks again, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm really curious because your career centers community-based projects and organizations from like High Arts, uh, which grew out of the Hip Hop Theater Festival to now the Apollo Theater and projects way too numerous to name, including the HBO film of Between the World and Me, and maybe I'm going to stop there for a moment and I'll ask the other piece of the question in a, in a, in a moment. Fantastic work on Between the World and Me. How did it happen? Uh, you're, you're a theater director. Had you directed film before? Is that something new for you? Uh, it was brand new. Um, uh, yeah, so I had adapted the book for the stage um, and that happened in 2018. This was my second season, maybe second season at the Apollo as executive producer and artistic lead. And um, this was a project that I had been cultivating um, and working. I knew ta -Nehisi. It's a very good friend of mine, very close friend of mine from Howard. Um, and, and I remember reading the book and knowing that I wanted to create a kind of communal experience um, with his words, right? He wrote a book in 2015, Between the World and Me was using the similar trope to James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, of writing letters to James Baldwin, wrote letters to his nephew, ta was writing letters to his son of what does it mean to be a Black, growing up as a young Black man in the age of Trayvon Martin, what are the lessons that we had to impart? And, you know, this is a topic that still remains timely. Um, and I read the book and felt like there was such a kinship of what he wrote on the page. I had felt in my bones, but didn't have language for. Um, and, and, and just imagine, envision the, the theatrical possibilities. Um, so 2018, uh, we started on that journey. Um, Apollo, and actually we partnered with the Kennedy Center uh, to build the work. Um, Sundance Labs came in and gave us a really amazing residency to really dissect the book. And I worked with two brilliant dramaturgs, um, Lauren Whitehead and Talvin Wilkes. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, and we, you know, it, we, we wrestled um, with the words and the topics. And so we were able to build a form um, um, similar to, if you think of like vagina monologues. Um, I worked on a, a, a project with Howard Zinn's work um, a few years earlier. Um, so it was a similar kind of form of taking a, sort of these very big ideas, but building them into individual monologues for actors um, and then built theatrical possibilities around that. So that was the theater work. And, and um, you know, and then 2020 happened and there was a pandemic and, and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor um, and knowing that this work was a response, an immediate response to what was happening in our world, um, but also knowing we could not gather to communicate this work that was about stirring conversation, that was about asking questions and sometimes answering them at the same time. Um, um, so we, we start on the journey of, well, let's make a film. Um, and let's make a film during the midst of a pandemic. And that's how it started. And it, yes, it was my first film. We shot in five different cities in the course of four months, um, not only shot, 
pre we were in pre-production, production, and post-production at, at times all at the same time <laughs> because we only we made it in four months. Well, beautiful work on it. Really, really Thank beautiful you. work. Really exciting. So, I mean, for you, communities are really at the heart of theaters. That's right. And I'm wondering um, how have communities and your work within communities influenced your aesthetic or the aesthetics of a project? How does it influence it for mm. you? I, I, I always think about, um, I'm always thinking about the world. Um, I'm always thinking about um, the audience um, um, and who's at the heart um, and, uh, you know, interestingly enough, when I think about even between the world and me, um, as a stage production and a film, I was very aware how traumatizing um, police shootings and, you know, are just for um, particularly the African American community um, and communities in general. Um, especially when every time we turn on the news or social media, there's a replaying. This summer, we saw literal replaying of yeah. death on screen. So that always went into my thinking about how do we tell this story, this very important story and not re-traumatize. So I kept having this notion in my mind of let's, I want this to be a beautiful love song that is, a, that is almost a love letter um, to people and to families. Um, so, you know, when I thought about the score, um, uh, the shots that we would use, um, the beautiful imagery coupled with um, these words in, in the tenderness. And I really leaned into that tenderness. So, and from my point, it was about how do we take care of the audience? Um, I didn't want this to be a piece um, that is, you know, again, you know, tragedy porn, if you will. Um, it was really to be a tool of healing. Um, and so I wanted to encapsulate it into all things beautiful um, and, and tender and loving, um, leaning into this idea of the humanity, the resiliency of humanity. I love it. I love it. That's incredible. So I'm really curious um, about uh, the Apollo and yeah. uh, what, are you, what are you desperate to see on stage there? Oh, People, <laughs> desperate to see people. And um, I think I was sharing with you the other day, Molly, I walked in the theater and, um, you know, I love, whenever I go to the Apollo, I was walk through the stage door and onto the stage. And I just was felt just a rush of just energy, just being in a theater again and seeing space. Um, and we only had like, there were only three people in the theater that were, you know, there at the time, but, I, I want I, I want to be next to people, um, be in space with people, um, you know, to laugh, to cry together, to you know, rail at the stage together, um, to yell, to scream. You know, the beautiful thing about the Apollo is that there's an energy about call and response. Um, but one thing we've also realized that this past year has taught us is that our Apollo is actually much larger than just the theater. Um, we've had to create as many theaters have digital spaces that exist otherwise, taking the idea of who we are and recreating it other places and that's exciting. But, um, but I miss human interaction, um, I really do. Me too, me too. So tell me, where are you seeing the glimmers of hope for the future? Yeah, you know, I, I think in this, this new way of working um, you know, what's so interesting is that I feel like at, at so many conferences in APAP, we wrote, there was always like this one sort of lonely panel about digital. <laughs> like, that was like way, you know what I mean? At all the at TCG, there was this lonely, right? Of like, how do we get into the digital world? We have been thrusted as theaters yeah. <laughs> to think in a different way, to work in a different way. And what I think is exciting is that, you know, it's expanded the audience. Um, when I see, you know, our audience base is now global. Um, for you know, theaters that are based in New York and Washington, D.C., we have the possibility to reach so many other people who may not be in proximity to our buildings. Um, again, reinforcing the idea that we are actually much larger than just our brick and mortar. Um, so that to me is one of the most exciting discoveries that the past year has taught us. I totally agree. We uh, are in a whole other area of being able to provide access to theatrical voices in the world. Yeah, yeah. In the world. In the world, I know, that's huge. I mean, our, our camp arena stage, we had, I, I forget, it was 14 states and a few different countries overseas, oh. including Bogota, Colombia. I mean, it just, 
Wow. It just ripples and yeah. ripples. And right. it's a it's a brave new world and uh, it's thrilling. Uh, you know, we've been dragged kicking and screaming into streaming, which so many of us have wanted to do for so many years, yeah. but we've been blocked by the unions. And finally, because of survival, everybody moved. We're in it. We're everybody in it moved. We're, we're in it. So may as well fall in love with it. That's well, it's incredible. so great to see you. Yeah, it's so and great. It's, it's been like so it. great to... Um, watch and experience your trajectory as a as an artist. Thank so you. thanks so much for coming on. Of course, thank you for having me. Can't wait to see you for real. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Bye. Bye. My guest next week will be Hannah Sharif, who is the artistic director of the Repertory Theater of St. Louis and Bayark Lee, Broadway, Tony Award winning actress, singer, dancer, and uh, choreographer. If you saw um, a bunch of different shows on Broadway, you would have seen Bayark. What's the one, Turkey Lurkey? You guys are all gonna be saying, uh, uh, she also uh, was in the original chorus line. She's fantastic. Uh, for tonight's gift of art, we highlight Ken Ludwig's Dear Jack, Dear Louise, Love Letter Experience. And in 2019, we introduced you to Louise Rabiner and Jacob Ludwig, the parents of playwright Ken Ludwig, and audiences fell in love with their heartwarming love story. And you can now experience the magic of their connection and intimate journey through a series of nine letters of handwritten correspondence, including letters, photos, and telegrams designed and handcrafted with period details by Arena Stage's props director, Jen Sheets, Assistance Prop Director Lance Pennington, and it was developed, this was her brainchild, by Arena Stage Casting Director, Line Producer, Teresa Sapiens. And so let's take a look at this. Even if you didn't see the show, you can experience uh, this uh, true love. It's a wonderful story. And who doesn't want to get things in the mail right? Hi, my name is Ken Ludwig and I wrote Dear Jack, Dear Louise. I came up with this idea to write Dear Jack, Dear Louise. Often I sort of walk through my uh, library and look at the books. For some reason, I have lots of pictures of my parents around the house. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to write something that really explored their lives uh, and I knew they had such a dramatic story because they met during World War II and they met by letter. Perhaps you have to be of my generation or a little bit younger to really remember what it was like getting personal letters in the mail. It was a wonderful thing and we don't get them anymore. I'm very excited that Arena Stage is doing this project because how often in our lives can we go to the mailbox, open the mail and find a letter from someone we've, we, we've learned to love. And this is one of those instances. Uh, it, it, it's a treat. What a smart idea. What a clever idea to take the letters that I wrote for this play and then turn them into genuine 3D letters written by hand. One letter that you'll get, one after another, each letter that you get in this project will be a combination of several letters in the course of the play. So it was really fun to tell that story over the course of, I think, what is it, eight or nine or 10 letters that are gonna comprise this project. And in a sense, tell the whole story of the play in those letters. So uh, my hat's off to Arena Stage for coming up with such an absolutely terrific idea.